second so some people can hop on. And uh, so I can take this thing off the screen right there. There we go. This high. There we go. Awesome. Okay, cool. All right. Jonathan, how are you doing, my friend? I'm great, man. Ready for this answer palooza. It was so much fun next time. I can't wait to dive in again. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, we uh, we had a lot of fun last time. Uh, so those of you guys who are watching this for the first time, we, we've we done this before. We did a, a live Q&A. We called it Guitar Answer Palooza. It was five hours long. We answered uh, somewhere around 118, 120 mm -hmm. questions. It was uh, it was grueling, but it was uh, we've gotten such great feedback that we wanted to do something like that again, and we're probably going to do it more regularly, regular, more regular. So, um, what? Uh, where it's not going to be five hours, so you guys don't have to worry. You don't have to get your coffee. Um, but we have selected some really great questions, and we're going to get into that. But before we do that. How are things going, Jonathan? Where are you at these days? They're going great. I'm actually in Puerto Rico right now. Um, got a window behind me, so that's why I got the little curtains. But um, yeah, regarding the answer palooza, um, you know, we we did do kind of a marathon. That's why we called it a palooza last time, and it did end up going five hours. It was, it was honestly brutal, but we got through it. We wanted to deliver answers to all your questions. But um, you know, although we did get amazing feedback, uh, we realized that at some point we were just trying to get through the number of questions. And I think that, you know, it, it's gonna be more helpful for you guys uh, whenever we back the number of questions down. So we've kind of cherry picked some really good questions that a lot of people ask. And we're gonna spend some really good time today going in depth and giving you really, really, really good quality answers. Yeah, awesome. So uh, we're, yeah, we're really excited about it. So I know there's still some people coming on. Uh, we have people in our, our, uh, our Breakthrough Guitar Super Group. Uh, and people watching on YouTube, so you guys can watch in either place. Um, if you have any questions or you have any comments, like while you're watching, uh, if you need us to clarify something, definitely put some some uh, you know engage in the comment section of either place. Uh, we are going to be there. I'm going to go and check out the YouTube side, make sure everything's looking good. Um, awesome. So um, I don't want to delay too long. I do want some more people to get on. I know that it's people like to trick trickle in. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we got maybe like uh, 15, 20, 20 questions for you guys today, um, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. So, but if if you are new, if you guys don't know who we are, my name is Brock Douglas. This is Jonathan Boyd. Um, we we run a company called Breakthrough Guitar, and Breakthrough Guitar is just an amazing online guitar school um, that teaches people how to break through, how to how to break through the mundane of trying to uh, go down the rabbit hole, not without any direction, trying to figure out how to really play guitar with the emotion that lives inside of you. Um, we, are, we are ingrained, with born with some type of emotion. Uh, and we want to be able to express that with uh, with the guitar or with whatever instrument. So I think uh, there's a lot of people that play multiple instruments. And um, yeah, you, there's a lot of really great stuff that comes out of Breakthrough. Yeah, so um, in addition to what Brock said, like you said, we all have music inside of us. We're all trying to get it out. But the biggest problem is, the problem that we're solving for you guys is that there's so much information overload out there today. There's so many videos on YouTube. There's so many books. There's so many courses. There's so many everything that it's really, really hard to know what to do, when to do it, who to learn it from. It just gets so overwhelming and so frustrating. So that's the problem that we're solving because the truth is, look, it seems like because there's so much content, because there's so much music theory, because there's so many different things that you could learn, uh, you feel like you, you should learn them. And it seems like you should learn all this stuff. But the reality is, uh, you know, Brock went on tour for 11 years where we're both music pros. The truth is you, you only need to know a few uh, key pieces of information or a few key things that really opens up a whole new world on the guitar. So you can express the music inside of you and you don't have to waste your time with all that stuff that's out there. Yeah, awesome. So if you guys are first timers or if, if you guys are watching this live, definitely put that in the comments below. We want to know how many people are here. Uh, just type in hashtag live. If you are watching the replay or you're watching on YouTube, watching the replay, let us know below in the comments. Uh, if you're new to our YouTube channel, definitely like, comment, subscribe uh, and hit the bell notification. We um, we are constantly posting uh, backing tracks that you guys can solo on top of. Uh, we are breaking down a lot of the teaching that we do inside of BreakthroughGuitar.com and uh, the last answer palooza, and we're uploading that to our YouTube in easy, digestible breakthrough bites so that you guys can uh, get some of the information that you might have missed from the last answer palooza, some some previous calls uh, and trainings that we've had. So definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel if you guys are watching on Facebook and you haven't been to the YouTube channel. 
definitely do that. It is a great source of information. Um, we have almost 2,000 subscribers over there, and it's growing, growing really rapidly, and we're just having a lot of fun. So without further ado, let's jump in and start answering some questions. How, how do you, you ready for it? For it? Yeah, let's go for it, man. All right, cool. Well, I'm just going to start at the top and work our way down. And the first one is from Molecular. Uh, the question is, I'm new to this and up to improvising major scales and loving it. For some reason, it all sounds great in key of B major, but crap in G and average in A. <laughs> Any ideas? Okay, so the first thing that we need to understand, let me break down a question first of all. So he's saying that he, he's loving improvising with major scales. And he's saying that if, when he plays in the key of B major, it sounds really good to him. Yet when he plays in the key of G major or the key of A major, for some reason, it doesn't sound so good. So we need to back up and really understand actually what's happening and how the guitar works from a fundamental level before we answer this question. So the first thing is that regardless of what key you're playing in, if you're playing a major scale, you're playing the same notes, meaning you're, you're playing the same feelings or the same sounds over and over again. It doesn't matter if you're in the key of uh, B or the key of A or the key of G. There's only one difference between any of those keys, and it's not how the notes feel relative to each other. The only difference is the pitch of the overall scale. Now, what I mean is we know at this point that, uh, or if you're new, maybe you don't, but we know that each major scale has seven different sounds or seven different right notes. And those seven different notes create seven different emotional feelings, right? When you play uh, note number one, for example, in the key of B, it gives you a certain feeling. It feels like home. Whereas if you play note number five, for example, it's going to feel very strong. It's going to feel like um, maybe like a cavalry charging into battle, like attacking the castle. It's a very strong feeling. Now, if you change those feelings, to the key of let's say A, or you slide down to the key of you know G or F or a different major key, those feelings do not change. If you play the first note and then you play the fifth note in the scale, you're still gonna get that feeling of that really strong feeling of like a cavalry charging into battle. Uh, the only difference is the overall pitch of the feelings. So let me give you an example. Let's say that we have a flight of stairs. And you know, when you walk up the stairs, there's a, there's a flat part and then there's a part that goes up and you just walk up the stairs. So let's say on each stair, you have a bag of marbles and inside the, the bag, there are seven different marbles. Now those marbles, the seven marbles represent the seven different feelings or the seven different uh, sounds that are in each key. Now, what a key is, is actually a container. A key, uh, most people don't really understand what a key is. And you know, it's, it seems confusing because the way everybody explains it is really confusing. But honestly, uh, a, a, the, the simple version is that a key is literally a container. It contains notes. So in a, the example of our marble bag, let's say we have a bag, the bag is the container, and inside the bag, we have seven different marbles. The marbles represent the seven different feelings or the seven different notes in each uh, major key or in any major key, right? So you have a bag of marbles, a bag of seven marbles, and it's sitting on one of the stairs. Now, if we go up the stairs, we can think of the pitch, the overall pitch, the highness or the lowness of sound going up. If we go down the stairs, the opposite is true. Let's say we're walking down the stairs, we're going down, down in pitch, and the pitch gets lower and lower and lower like that. The only difference between the keys is the pitch of the seven feelings. So you have your marble bag, and we can put a different marble bag or bag of marbles on each stair. So every single bag of marbles has seven marbles in it. It has seven feelings in it. If we go to the next stair up, that's like going to the next key up, the next adjacent key. For an instance, that's like going from the key of A major to A sharp major. And then you can go up another stair to B major. And then you can go up another stair to C major. And that's all we're doing. The seven notes and the seven feelings relative to each other inside the container of the key inside the marble bag, all those seven notes always feel exactly the same. The only thing that changes is the overall pitch of those feelings as you go down the stairs or down in keys or up the stairs or up in keys. So all of that to say, now that you understand a little bit about what keys are, all of that to say, it shouldn't matter if you play in the key of B major or you play in the key of A major or if you play in the key of G major, you're hitting all of the same seven feelings. 
the only way that it would really sound off or different or bad is if you, you might just be hitting the wrong notes. You might just uh, not be hitting the notes in the major scale. So what I would do is make sure that you're hitting the actual right notes. Uh, make sure you're using the same pattern in this case if you are going to uh, play in the key of B, A, or G major. And the reason I say use the same pattern is just because it's an easy way to hit the right notes. It's an easy way to hit the notes in the scale. So what do you think, Brock? Think that answers the question? Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I, I love the, the thought of the seven feelings. Um, and it's it's cool because um, you hear it a lot. The composers use it a lot. They use those feelings. When you're when you're watching a movie or watching a play or a drama or something, and the you know when something's about bad is about to happen because <laughs> they are playing into those feelings. I think they're probably the ones that use it the best. Um, those guys who are doing like TV shows and movies and just composing that music. Um, totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. You know when it's going to be happy. You know when it's going to be sad. You know when there's tension. Exactly. Like they know, they know how to pull on that, and then they know how to release that tension uh, mm -hmm. with the de different notes. So Yeah, so that's the benefit of learning the seven feelings, because when you learn them yourself, then you can control the emotion that you want to play. And that's the key, right? Remember at the beginning we said that we all have music inside of us that we want to express. Well, the only way you're going to be able to control that music or to express it and let it out in a way that you control on the fretboard is literally by learning the different the seven different feelings or the different feelings that you can play around with and learning how they interact with each other. Awesome. All right, so let's uh, let's roll on to the next question. I think that was a great answer, Jonathan. So I appreciate that. Um, and so, all right, cool. So the next one is is about relative minors. So relative minors are interesting to me. Uh, thanks for opening that door. What are the most important elements for playing in relative minor keys versus major keys? Uh, this is from Mark Monroe. So the question asked was, what are the most important elements between playing from minor keys and major keys? I think we're going to have to make a, a few assumptions here about what is being asked. If I question. So let's basically answer the question, what is the difference between playing in minor keys and major keys? Now, um, again, let's back up and let's think about the overall sound, overall mood. In general, what's the difference between minor and major? Well, we know they have different words, right? That's what we're talking about. We have the word called minor and we have a word called major. What does that actually mean? Before we talk about the actual guitar, what does it actually mean? Well, in general, um, Brock, you mentioned earlier about different feels that you can get when you're watching a movie. Maybe there's a, a part of a movie that's really sad or there's a part of a movie, like in a horror movie, where there's there's suspense and you know something's coming. Or maybe there's a part in a movie where somebody gets married and the, the feeling of the music is just very happy, right? So in general, the difference between major and minor is that major in general, uh, major keys, major chords, major anything, major scales, they generally feel happy. That's just a basic way to think about it. They generally feel, some people describe it as bright, um, happy, joyous, um, positive, optimistic. That's the kind of feeling that you get when you hear something major sounding. Now on the opposite in the spectrum uh, is minor. And minor is the opposite of major in terms of the feeling. So the feeling is uh, of minor is generally something that's dark or sad or melancholic. Um, like again, if you're watching a, a part of a movie that, um, uh, you know, not, not to go there, but maybe there's a part where there's a funeral or somebody, somebody's about to go to a funeral. The music is going to be a little bit dark, right? It's going to be a little bit almost depressing, almost um, um, melancholic, I think, is a very good word. So when we talk about playing, uh, well, first of all, that's the difference in the feeling, right, between major and minor. So now let's talk about the what does it actually mean on the guitar neck to play in, let's say, a major key versus a minor key? Well, so this is going to sound weird at first, but... When you play in minor keys versus major keys, you're playing different notes, which is what makes the sound different, yet at the same time, you're playing the same notes. So how does that make sense? Well, most people, when they think about uh, using what we call the guitar grid, all the right notes across the guitar neck, you have one master roadmap that tells you where all the, the right notes are. And most people think and teach, honestly, and this is a huge reason why it's so confusing. Most people teach that there are these things called minor scales and there are these things called major scales. And they're two different things, or at least they think they're two different things. But the truth is there's only one scale. There's only one set of patterns. There's only one master roadmap. 
to play in major and minor keys. Now I'll explain more about what I mean in just a second about that, but let's first back up and think about this. The major scale is the basis or the foundation of everything in music, specifically everything in Western music. Now this doesn't apply if you like to listen to say traditional Indian music, which I, I love that kind of music. Uh, let's say Pakistani music or something that's based on an entirely different musical system. But for our purposes, 99.9999% of the songs that we all listen to are based in, it's called Western music, the Western musical system. And um, everything in Western music is based on the major scale. Now, why do I bring that up? <clears throat> well, remember when I said a minute ago that the major scale and the minor scale are actually, this, there's not two different scales, there's only one. There's only one master roadmap. You only have to learn where the notes are one time. And when you do that, then you can actually play in major or minor scales. So what's the difference? It's really, it's, it's laughably simple. The only difference between playing in a minor scale or playing in a major scale in reference to the, the master roadmap, in reference to where all the right notes are, is you simply start on a different note. That's literally it. Now, let's say I'm gonna play in the key of A major, and here's my A note right here. If I start playing a, a what we would call a major scale pattern, the truth is it's actually not a major scale pattern. It can be a major scale pattern. We just call it a major scale pattern because it's easier to think about, right? Let me start on A and play my major scale pattern, and therefore I'm playing in the key of A major. But the truth is you could be playing in seven different keys. You could be playing in a number of different keys is the point. Uh, but of course, when we that sounds confusing and that makes it more confusing. So we don't need to talk about that at that point. All we need to talk about is how do you actually play in a major key? Now, it turns out that when you, let's say you're gonna play in the key of A major, let's say, or excuse me, you're, it turns out that if you start on A and you play your, what we call the major scale pattern, and then you connect the major scale across the neck, the exact same location of all the notes that you just laid out doesn't change if you wanna play in a minor key. There's something called relative minor. And the, the purpose of this explanation now is not to explain what relative minor is, but it's to give you an insight into what it is as it relates to the major scale. Now for every major scale, a, AKA for our purposes, every major scale starting point, like if I start here on A, first of all, it doesn't matter where I play on the guitar neck, it can still be in the key of A, but this is just for example, so we can follow what I'm talking about. If we start on A, and we play what we call the major scale pattern, we can say we're playing in the key of A major. But it turns out if I connect all of those A major scales across the entire guitar neck, I can also play in a minor key, a minor scale that has or uses all of the exact same notes in the exact same locations as the key of A major. That's what a relative minor key is. So in this case, if I'm playing in A major, and I, let's say again, I start my major scale pattern. By the time I connect all the, the, uh, the major scales or the, the patterns across the neck and I have my entire master roadmap, it turns out that if I just start on this note right here, which is F sharp, and I still play the major scale patterns, I'm actually gonna be playing what most people refer to as a minor scale. And what I mean for our purposes is the location of the notes as it relates to the physical hand pattern that I'm using is different. That's why it sounds different than the A major pattern if I start on F sharp and then play what most people would refer to as a minor pattern. The reason it sounds different is because literally I'm playing a different pattern. But what most people don't realize is that the actual names of the notes that I'm playing are exactly the same as the ones from, from the A major scale. So for any major key, meaning any container, a key is a container. Any major key that contains a certain number of notes, let's say it's notes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's also going to be what, what's called a relative minor key, meaning there's going to be a mirroring minor key that shares those exact same notes. And I'm talking about the letter notes like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So for an example, let's actually say that there are no letters in music. Let's say there's only numbers. So in the key of A major, let's say we have the notes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And now let's say in the key, in the relative minor key of F sharp minor, we also have the notes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
The only difference is in the minor key, I'm starting on number six, and that's the only difference. Because I'm starting on number six, the actual physical hand pattern that I'm playing is different on the neck, and that's what makes it sound different. Now, in terms of sound, this is where we go back to where we started, which is, what is the difference in sound? Well, when I play the major scale, it sounds happy or bright or optimistic or joyous. If I play a minor scale, it doesn't matter where it is, any minor scale is going to sound sad, melancholic, uh, even depressing, dark, etc. And that is the difference. Still there, Brock? All right, here we go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of good stuff, a lot of good detail. And I think that's um, one of those things that's a lot of people, it, they, it feels too confusing for them, too daunting uh, to understand the the how major and minor skills relate to each other. Um, yeah, you if you if you understand what Jonathan just taught you, then it cuts the amount of scales, or the amount of uh, yeah keys in half. In half, exactly. Literally, yep. just cuts them in half. So. Awesome. All right, so let's jump into the next question. All right, <clears throat> this one is. Let, I mean, let, let me jump down and and uh, uh, throw in a, a a gear type question. This one's from Gene Sanderson. Okay, here we go. I thought you were going to say Gene Simmons. I got excited there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he got in our call. All right, uh, I, I have an acoustic guitar, and I was told I could attach an amp on it to make it sound really cool or more vibrant. What do you suggest that I, I can use? Is that a thing? So having an acoustic guitar and amplifying it? Yeah, like I, th I think people are surprised that you can amplify an acoustic guitar even more okay. than what okay. it already is. Right, right. Okay, so the question is, can I amplify a an acoustic guitar, basically? So the question is, yes, of course you can. So I think most people see electric guitars and they see that, you know, they, they make the, um, the association between electric guitars and electric guitar amplifiers, right? You take your electric guitar and you plug it into your amp. That's just normal. That's what people do. Now, when it comes to an acoustic guitar, that's a lot less common. So I think some people might not be aware that you can plug an acoustic guitar into an amp. And in fact, they make things called acoustic guitar amplifiers. Go figure. Mm -hmm. They make specific amplifiers for your acoustic guitar. That's just kind of like a, um, it, it seems just like an electric guitar amplifier, except it's just kind of tweaked a little bit differently. The, the internals or the electronics are a little bit different, um, but it's made for an acoustic guitar. So that's one thing you can do. Another thing that you can do, uh, which I think we're all you know bombarded by ads these days. I think I've, I've seen a few um, ads for some, some kind of amplifier that you can actually put on the body of your guitar. I don't know if I would, if I had a nice acoustic guitar, I don't know if I would want to mess up the finish on it, but you can, they, they do sell some type of amps that attach to the body of your guitar. Uh, and apparently it amplifies the sound uh, right there. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but those are the two different ways that you can amplify your acoustic guitar. Yeah. I've seen some really cool pocket amps. I think that might be what they're, uh, yeah, like it kind of clips onto your pocket. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, there are, there are some really cool ones. Yeah, so it's it's definitely a thing that people do all the time. Um, country artists are a good example. Um, the majority of country artists that are out there singing and playing are playing on an acoustic and they're amplifying it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's gonna it's gonna you can add some like some nice tones, some nice reverbs uh, when you're playing with other people. Um, if you're playing with a band, or you know you might want to amplify it a little bit more, but even playing by yourself, you're going to get a completely different tone and you have more control over the acoustic guitar with an amplifier, more control over the, the not just the volume, but like the low end and the mid range, the high end, and just the shape of, of how it sounds. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, if you, if you're really serious about playing acoustic guitar, I definitely would recommend checking, checking that out. Um, yeah battery powered amps they have a lot of those so, <laughs> i used to and when i was in high school um i was sort of a troublemaker i never got in major trouble but i had a backpack um that i got from a buddy who took some battery powered computer speakers and screwed them into the backpack so i used to walk around with my walkman cd player and just walk around the halls of the school playing blasting music as loud as i wanted um you literally can do the same thing with an acoustic guitar. <laughs> so, all right. Okay, next question. Um, let's see. 
Uh, let's do uh, this one is on uh, guitar picks. Uh, this one's from Mark Carroll. A pick has three different angles in which it can be held. Discuss the best way or angles to hold a pick for the best and fastest alternate picking. Okay. So the question is, um, the, the assumption is that the pick or with your pick, you have three different angles that you can pick with. And Brock, you said the question was, what's the best picking angle for fast uh, alternate picking? Yeah, he wants you to discuss the different angles, the best angles to hold the pick for different, yeah, for different, I guess, picking styles or yeah, alternate picking. Okay, so basically, what's the best way to hold the pick or what's the best angle, really, more specifically, to hold the pick to be able to pick faster? Essentially, I think that's what we're getting at here. So first of all, let's, uh, let's be clear about something that in this question, it was assumed that there are three different picking angles. Well, Brock, how many degrees does a circle have in it? 360 at least. And how many, how many different ways can you divide one degree? How many times can you divide one degree in half? Um, I would say an infinite amount. Infinity, of right, yeah. right, right. Okay, so the pick is flat, right? The pick is two dimensional. Uh, I mean, technically it's three dimensional, but we can just say it's two dimensional, right? So if I have my pick flat on a string, how many degrees can I rotate the pick before it gets flat again? 180. 180 degrees. And anywhere in between that 180 degrees, how many different variations can I have? Or how many different, uh, how many different ways can I half the degrees that I'm, that I'm turning? There's an infinite range. Mm -hmm. There's a spectrum, right? I have 180 degrees that I can turn the pick. Okay, so first of all, there's not only three ways to hold the pick, or there's not only three ways to angle the pick. There's literally 100, an infinite way, uh, an infinite number of ways, or an infinite number of angles to hold the, or to angle the pick within 180 degrees. Okay, so you can angle it this way, you can angle it this way, this way, this way, this way. So it exists on a spectrum. Now let's just talk about something that's a general principle of physics. Everybody loves physics, right? Um, the, the, the pick is flat on two sides and it's very thin and round on this side. Now in general, if I'm trying to pick a string, if I put the flat side of the pick on the string, because it's flat, because there's a lot of surface area, it requires a lot of force to pick through the string. And then when I do that, I pick it really hard and it sounds really harsh, right? But if I angle the pick a little bit, what happens is now the edge of the pick is in a sense slicing through the string. And it's a lot easier for, for my pick actually to go through all of the strings at an angle like that. So the, the point is there's not a best way or there's not a perfect way or there's not a predetermined perfect angle to turn your pick. You just need to think about, well, if my pick is flat and I'm trying to do alternate picking or economy picking or any kind of picking and my pick is flat against the strings, it's gonna be harder to pick. And because it's gonna be harder to pick, it's gonna slow you down and you won't be able to pick as fast. So the goal is to start angling your pick. If I have my pick flat, the goal is to start angling your pick a little bit so that it starts to slice through the strings as you pick. Now, what I would do is go to the extremes and then find a sweet spot. What I mean is start with a flat, uh, start with your pick flat on the strings, see how that feels. It's probably gonna feel really bad because it's hard to pick through the strings with your pick flat. So start to angle it a little bit. Now, let's say you're playing a pattern. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you're doing with your left hand as long as you're doing, uh, as long as you're playing across all of the strings. You can even just play like this if you want to. You don't have to do anything with your fretting hand. But start to angle it a little bit and then play whatever you're gonna play and see how that feels. Then angle it a little bit more, see how that feels. If I angle it too much, look where my elbow is going. Look where my elbow and my shoulder is going. I mean, that's just, you know, that's gonna get ridiculous and uncomfortable, right? So you're not gonna go that far. That's just an extreme. So go to the extreme, see where it feels. Uh, there's gonna be a sweet spot where it feels bad at first when the pick is perfectly flat and it's gonna to start to feel a little better, a little better. You might find a sweet spot there, but go all the way to the extreme to where it feels uncomfortable again. And then go back and forth until you dial it in to that perfect little sweet spot. Now, uh, first of all, that's how to find the, the, the picking angle um, that will allow you to play the fastest for whatever it is that you're trying to play. Uh, part of this is it depends on what you're trying to play, right? But the other part is I don't want you to think so much about how you're moving your hand or what you're doing or what the angle is or what the square root of five is. You don't need to be thinking while you're doing that. 
at first think about it and try to practice it to find a general picking angle that will work for you and then just play the guitar just play and play and play because you get used to it and then over time it, it, the pick just becomes a part of your fingers and yes everybody still drops picks even people who've been playing for 60 years right everybody does it it's not just you i promise but if you just play and just focus on playing the picking angle will take care of itself as long as you're aware of the fundamentals and you kind of find a little sweet spot then just play Try to relax, try to play comfortably, and over time, you're going to find your own sweet spot. It's going to feel perfectly comfortable, and you'll be able to play faster and faster. Yeah, we've had some students who have been playing guitar for, you know, 20 years. Um, and just a tiny little tweak to how they hold their mm -hmm. guitar pick has has made the difference. Um, so, but yeah, it's, I think it's something you experiment with, and you play around with, and mm -hmm. you find what works best for you. Right. In fact, we had a student the other day who's, who literally said she doubled her picking speed with one little tweak. There's one of the videos and one of the courses that we have specifically on how to hold the pick. Um, she said that one of the little tweaks, one of the little insights in that video, she said literally doubled her picking speed instantly. So that was awesome. Love it. I love it. All right. So next question is from Robert Acosta. It says, when I'm creating a lead, can I mix pentatonic patterns together? And how about major... Uh, scales, can I mix them in together too? So I think the question is, can you mix pentatonic and major scales uh, together when you solo? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you're playing lead guitar, when you're soloing, can you mix together different scales or different types of scales? Now, most people who are who have played any kind of lead guitar or who have started learning lead guitar, they've heard of scales and they've heard of potentially the pentatonic scale maybe the major scale, the minor scale, those are the three most popular ones. And then we also have other scales uh, like the Dorian scale or different types of modes that some, some people might have heard of, et cetera. Now it's not really not important what you've heard of or what you haven't heard of. The point is we have different types of scales, right? And the question is, can we mix those together when we're playing? And the answer, the answer is, of course, absolutely. Uh, that's what I would almost, I was about to say most great guitar players do mix scales. I would say a lot of them do that. Uh, a lot of them don't do that. Honestly, a lot of them, especially rock and roll players, kind of rely on the pentatonic scale, especially if you're playing blues or something like me, that's still in the pentatonic realm, so they can get that blues type sound. But when it comes to mixing different scales together, let's make sure we're not making a, an assumption. I think this question is actually coming from um, someone who's actually focusing on the actual patterns that they're playing as they're playing the guitar. And I want to make a distinction that we don't want to focus on the patterns, or, or excuse me, we do want to focus on the patterns at first, but the only reason we want to focus on the patterns is just to be able to play the right notes without having to think about the names of the notes. That's it. We just want to learn the patterns just so we can hit the right notes, right? And once we learn the patterns and we start getting comfortable with the patterns, then of course the goal is, let's say you learn uh, pa a pattern and you learn how to connect the fretboard with different patterns. So let's say you have pattern number one here, doesn't matter what the scale is. Let's say you have pattern number two here, and then you have pattern number three here. Let's say you have these three different patterns, and your goal at first is to learn how to, quote, connect this much of the fretboard by playing all the right notes, by connecting these three different patterns together. Now, at first, that's the easiest place to start. Why? Because it's really simple to learn a, 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 an easy finger pattern, and then learn a second easy finger pattern, and then learn a third easy finger pattern. But more, most people get stuck as they actually focus, they keep focusing their attention on the actual patterns themselves when after they have, have not mastered the patterns, but after they've just learned where the notes are, then they should shift their attention, they should shift their focus away to the actual music that they're playing. The patterns are just a vehicle to allow us to hit the right notes. Whenever you can hit the right notes, that's the first hurdle to get over because now you're no longer thinking about where are the right notes. Now that's the time to start focusing on the music that you're playing, the music that you're hearing when you play your guitar, and the music that, let's say you're playing with a background track, a uh, backing track, or you're playing with maybe another person. Either way, there's going to be music in the background. Your attention needs to be available to listen to that background music. And the only way you can do that is by first just learning the patterns, just so you don't have to think about where the right notes are. So after you learn the patterns, you then shift to thinking about the actual music, and then once we have defined, let's say, this amount of the fretboard, where let's say we learned pattern one, whatever pattern scale that is, we learn pattern two, whatever scale that is, we learn pattern three, and we're connecting these three things together. Well, guess what? After we learn these three patterns, 
Well, now the goal is to erase the lines in between the patterns. The most people get stuck in patterns and boxes. That's because they never take their attention off the pattern or the box. And they never focus on the music that they're making. They never let their ear guide their fingers, right? And there are specific ways to do that. I don't mean you literally just pick up your guitar and you're supposed to just know how to do it. That's true, right? There are specific ways to do that. There's specific ways to train on that. But the whole point is once you learn these three, let's say patterns, the goal after that is to erase the lines in between the patterns. That's what we call stitching the patterns together. Uh, by the time you stitch all the patterns together, you have one seamless fretboard, literally. And that's the point. So Brock, what was the rest of that question? It was, uh, and how about major scales? Uh, I'm sorry. I find it difficult. Uh, no, sorry. Perfect. Yeah. Can I mix? Yeah. Can I mix? Okay. Yeah, mix them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So again, let's say you've learned some patterns and let's say you've learned some patterns with different scales or what most people call different scale patterns. Now, this is a different topic, but the, the term scale patterns or scale pattern is misleading because a scale is not a pattern. Or in other words, if I'm learning a particular pattern on the fretboard, that pattern itself is not a scale. I'm playing a scale with the pattern, but a scale is just a series of notes. I can play the same series of notes. Let's say I play the notes A, B, C. Let's say that's a scale, the A, B, C scale. Well, I can play the notes A, B, C in a million different places on the fretboard. I would be curious to know what the real number is, but a lot of different places on the fretboard um, in different combinations. So maybe I can play it here. I can play the A, B, C scale here or here or here or here. It doesn't matter where I go. So it's a little misleading when we say that a pattern itself is a scale. Remember, the pattern is just a vehicle to get you to hit the right notes within the scale without having to think about the names of the notes. So back to the question about when I'm playing lead guitar, can I blend in different types of scales? Meaning, can I uh, mix pentatonic scale with, let's say, the major scale or the minor scale? And of course, again, the answer is absolutely. So why would you want to do that? Well, if we think about what a scale is, like I said a minute ago, a scale is a series of notes. That's great. That's the boring answer, right? No, nobody wants to hear that a scale is a series of notes because it doesn't do anything for us. We're trying to play music. Music is just an expression of an emotion, right? It's an aural emotion, uh, emotional expression. And when, if we were going to play different types of scales, the reason we would do that is to express different feelings, to express different themes. For example, if I wanted to pick up the guitar and play something like uh, that sounded like blues, well, I'm going to play the pentatonic scale. Why? Because the pentatonic scale sounds like blues, right? It's, it's not that the pentatonic scale sounds like blues. It just so happens that blues uses the pentatonic scale, so everybody associates uh, the pentatonic scale with blues, right? doesn't mean you always have to play the pentatonic scale, but it gives you that blues feeling. It gives you that blues sound. Whereas on the other hand, uh, some, like a major scale in general, it's really hard to make uh, a one statement about what a major scale sounds like, but it's generally going to sound, again, happier. Maybe some people might think it sounds a little bit like classical music, or it can sound like classical music, or maybe more complex music with like different chords that's maybe not necessarily uh, a pop song, or it could also be pop songs as well, like happy, upbeat type sounding pop songs. Now, on the other hand, we have, let's say, the minor scale. If you were going to play a minor scale, well, that might mean because you want to express some kind of a sad or some kind of dark or some kind of uh, angry emotion. And again, that's the reason why you would play those different scales. Now, the only thing that you can't do is mix anything that's major and minor at the same time. You can't play in a major key and a minor key at the same time. That's the only thing you can't do. So basically, you can't be happy and sad at the same time. you got to pick one, right? But yes, you can absolutely and you should absolutely focus on or, or practice uh, experimenting with mixing different types of scales. They all have to be in the same key. But experiment with mixing different types of scales, a.k.a. mixing different types of sound themes together when you play. When you do that, the musical landscapes that you will be able to paint will be a lot more bright, a lot more vivid, a lot more colorful, with a lot more depth. And that's the stuff that keeps people wanting to listen. Great answer. I love it. Next question is going to be from Michael Parnell. And Michael asks, when I play a solo over a backing track, um, and it's awesome, and I'm lost in the moment, I record myself, I find it difficult to repeat the solo like I did before. 
Is this normal? Man, this is a great question. This is a great question. Okay, so when I'm playing lead guitar, when you're playing lead guitar, you get lost in the moment. First of all, that's the most amazing feeling on the planet, in my opinion. It really is. Uh, it literally can bring you to tears. So whenever you, you, you're you playing lead guitar, you're playing with a backing track or something, you just get lost in the moment. And the question is, I can't really repeat uh, what I played when I was lost in the moment after the fact. Is that bad? Is that a bad thing? No. That's actually the best thing. Why? Because that means you weren't thinking when you were, when you were playing. You were just feeling it. You were letting it flow. Um, this is a little bit of an odd concept for people, some people, to, to think about. But if you imagine driving in your car and listening to your radio, you know how you have to, like, let's say we used to have to turn the dial or you hit the button to tune in, literally to tune in to a specific frequency or a specific radio station? And only when you tune in to a particular radio station, the music starts coming through. Well, guess what? We are all radios, okay? I know this sounds weird, but we are all radios. And there's music wanting to come through. You literally just have to change the frequency mentally. You have to let it, uh, let yourself find the signal to where the music starts flowing and then it starts coming out of your guitar. Okay, it sounds kind of weird, but that's exactly how it works. And what this question is asking about is, when I actually dial in, when I tune into the station and the music starts flowing through me, first of all, like I said, that's the best feeling on the planet. But the second thing is, is that bad that I can't remember what I played or that I can't repeat what I played? And again, the answer is absolutely not because you were in the zone. You were in the moment. You were just letting the music flow. And that's the, that's the highest level of playing music. That's like true musicianship right there. Now, if you can't remember what you played, who cares? Think about it like this. If you, uh, well, of course, unless you're wanting to write a song, then record yourself playing because then you can go back and listen to it and you can see those awesome parts or at least the parts that you thought were awesome. You can go back and listen to those parts again and then you can figure it out, you know, how to play it on your guitar. But in general, uh, if you can't play, like I said, if you can't repeat something after you've, you've, you're in the zone, you come out of the zone, you can't repeat it earlier. Think about it like this. If you're having a really good conversation with somebody, your responses, if somebody asks you a question, and maybe you're talking about a really deep topic that you really care about, your responses are gonna be 100% tailor-made to the specific question that the person is asking you at that moment in time, right? If you had any kind of a cookie cutter answer, and this is a huge problem, this is probably the biggest problem with all the this stuff out there that just teaches you how to play specific licks or specific riffs, that you take this one piece of music that exists in time and you try to uh, fit it into another piece. Like if I'm having a conversation with a friend and let's say I, I have the same, uh, we're having a very deep conversation, I'm gonna respond exactly to what the person is asking me or exactly what we're talking about. But if we were having, a, if I was in another conversation with another person and I said that exact same thing, it wouldn't really resonate. Like it doesn't really fit the scenario. And that's because I wouldn't have really been listening to what the person is saying. So it's exactly the same as going to a foreign country. Let's say you're gonna go to, I'm in Puerto Rico right now, so let's say you only know uh, where is the bathroom in, in Spanish, you know? And uh, you, let's say you know how to say, where is the bathroom and hi, nice to meet you. Well, if you walk in a McDonald's or if you walk into a restaurant <laughs> and the, the waitress comes up and you don't really understand what she says and you say, hi, nice to meet you, where is the bathroom? It's a little bit awkward, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really fit. So again, the, the best thing that you can ever uh, hope for as a musician is to have fluency in the language of music. And when you can respond to the specific situation, um, remember I just said something about having a, a really deep conversation. Music is literally just a conversation. In fact, uh, one of the greatest jazz guitar players of all time, Pat Metheny, happens to be one of my favorite guitar players. Um, he said, music at its best is like a great conversation with an old friend. And I think that's amazing. But specifically as it relates to what we're talking about right now, if you're not listening, if you're not tuned in, and the music isn't flowing through you, and you're not responding to the specific situation at hand, the specific conversation that's going on right now, well, you're not really playing. You're just regurgitating. And we all know that regurgitating is not any fun. So no, absolutely a great thing that you can't remember what you played after you play it. Um, if you want to be able to remember, 
just record yourself when you play so you can go back and listen later and then figure out those cool little ideas that you had. But yeah. That was so good. Yeah, that's a gold mine right there. Have you ever um you ever you ever told a, a friend a story or a, told a joke and then another person comes up and asks, "Oh, what what are you guys talking about?" and you have to say it again and then another person walks up and you have to t- So when that happens to me, I try to I'm con- I'm like really like I realize I don't want to say it the same exact way to this person because they're gonna be like, ah, he's just like, it's, it's, it's too cookie. So I try to, yeah. So what I try to do is change it up a little bit every time so that it's unique for every single person. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, what I think what you said there, I think that's, it's a goldmine for, for a lot of people. Like they, too many people get stuck in just learning licks and then just pulling out those licks. Well, we, we have a course called the the greatest musical ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, And what it, what it teaches um, is to, Get ideas from 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 these great artists and who who use who use the same i they use the same ideas over and over and over again in their music, but in different ways. And we can take those ideas and instead of regurgitating, we can recreate them uh, in different ways. Um, mm-hmm. My wife is I've been talking to her and have really deep conversations, and then the next day she's like, "Hey Brock, what was that thing you you <laughs> said to me?" And I'm like. What are you talking about? She's like, you, man, you said something that was just so profound, and I'm like, I have no idea. What, what were we talking about? Like, like, <laughs> like, I, I honestly think, I honestly think that when you are really, really into playing your instrument, you're really sitting down. There, you should have those deep, intimate conversations with your instrument, just like that, where it felt great in the moment, and you really had a great experience. But that sometimes it's just between you and your guitar. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's not meant for the world. Maybe um, you're doing some internal healing or whatever it is. You're you're speaking. Um, your your soul is speaking out through the guitar, or, or you're speaking. You know what I'm saying. Basically, I think what you said was great. And if any of you guys missed that, I definitely think when this is over, you rewind and watch that that segment. I'm sure we have more coming up, and there's some great stuff said already. But that was, I think, is a goldmine for a lot of you guys. Yeah, and that's really the key. Um, a lot of people, there's so many things that we could talk about on this topic, and I know we have other questions to cover, but what what we just talked about is really kind of the essence or is the key to actually sounding musical. It's the key to sounding like a musician instead of some, you know, just some guy who's just picking up the guitar and messing around, right? Like, I think we all feel that way, or at least a lot of us feel that way uh, for a long time, that you know, other people are out there playing real music and it sounds good. It sounds great. I want to listen to it. It's like candy to your ears. But when I pick up the guitar, I'm just kind of clunking around. I'm just playing it. It sounds like a scale. Where's the music? Go back and listen to what we just talked about. That's where the music comes from. Yeah. Awesome. So good. So good. Yeah. I mean, we could, I honestly feel like we could, <laughs> we could talk on that topic for hours. So, but we'll save it for another day. All right. Let's go to the next question. This one's from uh, Neil Whitman is how do you warm up for a practice session? That's a good question. That's a great, great short answer. Um, one thing I want to point out. So how do you warm up for a practice session? So one thing I want to point out is that you should warm up. Most people don't even think about that. They just pick up the guitar and kind of noodle around or start playing, right? But the, the, the truth is you don't there are different stages of, let's say, one specific practice session. And when I say the words practice session, I don't mean sitting down to a grueling schedule and like, I'm going to practice scales for 10 minutes and I'm going to practice chords for 10 minutes. And some people that works for, I never did. I could never do that. Right? I tried it over and over, always failed at that. Never, could never, ever, ever uh, practice that way. But what I'm saying is whenever there's something that you want to get better at on the guitar, let's say there's one specific chord progression or there's one specific lick that you're playing. Well, the truth is there are different levels of warmness uh, whenever you play. So you pick up the guitar and your fingers are probably a little stiff at first. And then what happens is as you keep playing, of course we call it warming up, right? Your fingers literally warm up. They get a little more flexible. You get a little more, uh, you start hitting the notes a little bit more accurately. But also what happens is your brain warms up too. So not only does it do your fingers warm up, the the level at which you can let the music flow through you or just kind of play without thinking uh, also warms up and it becomes more and more and more. It's kind of like opening a faucet. If you open up a faucet a little bit, there's a few drips coming out. 
So when you first pick up the guitar, a few drips pick up on it now, like, okay, I want some more water now. But if you just keep uh, warming up and keep keep playing a little bit, it's like the faucet turns on all the, all the way. And then until, you know, the point where you're really flowing at some point, that's what, you know, that's when we call it getting hot, like, or he's really on. If somebody's playing on stage one night, maybe they start out with the first couple of songs that they're playing and it's kind of okay. We've probably all been to concerts like that where the first few songs are like, eh, okay. And then it kind of gets better as it goes along. And then man, by like the three quarters of the way through, by like the 10th song, they are just on it. The, the band is just on fire. They're really on top of it. They're hot, right? So that's kind of the same thing happens every single time you pick up your guitar. So what's the best way to warm up for a practice session? Honestly, uh, one thing that, that I do that gets kind of boring is um, what you can do is literally just play, let's say I played this note and then the, the next fret with my next finger and the next fret with my next finger, the next fret with my next finger. That's it, just four notes using all my fingers. And I'm just gonna go, uh, Brock, tell me if you can hear this. Uh, can you hear my guitar? Yep. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. You sound good. Sorry. Okay, cool. No worries. So uh, what I'm going to do, and I want to make two distinctions here. So what I generally do, I, I kind of move around the fretboard, but I'll give you a very simplified version. So I pick up the guitar and I'm not really thinking about anything, right? All I'm thinking about is trying to hit the notes well, meaning make them sound good like that. And I'm just going to go to the next string, but I'm not just going to play like I'm playing a I'm going to put a rhythm to and that's the key to warming up and starting to sound musical a lot faster. So I might go something like that. I might just kind of move around. It doesn't matter which notes I hit. I'm not trying to impress anybody or I'm not trying to sound really good or anything. It doesn't matter. I'm just trying to get my fingers moving. And I might just keep playing around the fretboard a little bit. And then what's going to happen is as I kind of just shake the dust off a little bit, and I might just start to play something, might start to improvise move around the fretboard a little bit, maybe play a few chords. And by that t by that point, I'm kind of getting into it. And by the time I start to literally warm up and I start to get to the point where, uh, you know, I can move my fingers a little bit easier and I'm really starting to enjoy the playing, then I might actually focus on what am I trying to get better at? What is that one thing that I want to focus on right now to try to improve? And for me, you know, would it be like, let's say, Let's say I'm playing some kind of arpeggio or something, or let's say I'm playing some kind of a scale or some kind of part of a song, or maybe some kind of a little lick, or, or maybe even just an exercise or something. But all I'm gonna do, my point is that I'm going to just literally play around with a rhythm. That's the most important part. Make sure you try to hit the notes and you know sound reasonably well. You wanna practice playing well, but have the rhythm you're playing and then actually you start to like, okay, I wanna start playing some music with it. And then that's the time, at least for me, that's the time where I start to really focus my brain on, okay, what's that thing I wanna get better at? Now that I'm warmed up, now that I'm being efficient, I'm making my practice efficient by already being warm and then starting to practice. In the same way, uh, a race car, you don't, uh, if, if a race car is gonna go run a race, it's, you don't just turn on a cold car, take it out of the garage and go straight to the track and start running around, right? You're probably gonna blow up the engine. You just don't do that. So the same thing, you know, the same thing is true on your guitar. You don't just pick it up and just start going if you haven't picked up your guitar all day or in weeks, it, do, it doesn't matter. You don't just pick it up and just start going. You pick it up and you let the engine warm up a little bit. When the engine gets to, you know, uh, cruising temperature, then you start playing. I had an amazing visual when you said that of someone picking up their <laughs> guitar and just shredding and it exploding. Yeah, yeah. They, anyway. Smoke everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Back to the Future where he plugs plugs it in and turns it up to 11 and the speakers explode. Yeah. Hey, I just want to give a shout out real quick. Uh, hey, Charlie, nice to have you on here. Charlie said he just got the course and he said it is working. So great to have you, Charlie. Thanks so much for joining. We love having you in here. Can't wait to talk to you on uh, in the course. And uh, Dan, also great to have you on here as well. Love that you guys are hanging out on here with us. Thank you. Yeah, and if uh, we still got a few more questions, but if you guys are interested in checking out Breakthrough Guitar and you've never done it before and you're watching on YouTube, there is a link in the description on how to check out the one of our free courses so you can get your feet wet and uh, learn how to play guitar by feel, the lead guitar light bulb moment. So let's jump into the next question. And this one is from Michael. Jumping from string to string, I often muff out or strike a string by mistake with my left hand. Is it better technique to apply pressure with the tip of the pad of the left fingers? Okay, so the question is, when I'm playing, I often mute notes, right? Or I miss notes or I mute notes with my fretting hand. 
And is it better to play with the, the pads of your fingers? So what I say that a lot of uh, beginner guitar players and, and a lot of intermediate guitar players actually, in fact, I'm, I'm very surprised by how many people have been playing for 10, 20, 30 years and still play with the pads of their fingers like this. So when they play some notes, they don't necessarily, you see how my hand is kind of curled around here? Uh, they don't necessarily play the note with the tip of their finger. And when I say the tip, I don't mean like your fingernail. You don't want to do that, right? You want to have a balance. You don't want to play with your fingernail, but you don't want to play with the pad of your finger either. But a lot of people do play with the, fat, the pad of your finger. And, you know, it's just simple physics that if you play with the pad of your finger, uh, there's, there's just a big, bigger, flatter area, and you're a lot more likely to either not press the string all the way down because this part of your finger is softer than the very end, than the very tip right here, which where, which is where you should develop calluses and make it harder. But this part of your, the fleshy part of your finger right here is really soft. So even if you press the fretboard down all the way, you press uh, your finger down on the fretboard all the way, well, your finger might actually be so soft that the string is still off the frets. So it actually doesn't, the, the, the note doesn't play because the strings aren't pressed all the way down to the fret. So that's one thing that can happen. Another thing is that just because of the pad of your finger is a lot bigger than the tip of your finger, well, it's super easy to hit maybe two notes at a time. That's why, like, let's say we're making an extreme example of this is bar chords. If I'm going to make a bar chord, I'm going to flatten my entire finger to put across the neck. Well, that's because I want to play all the strings. But if I would just want to play individual notes, well, I don't want to flatten my finger. I don't want to play with the pad of my finger, with my finger flat like this. I want to play with the tip of my finger. Just like this. Uh, here you go. Here's an easier angle. I just want to play with the tip of my finger, not the fingernail, not the pad, just the tip. And over time, when you practice doing that, you'll be able to hit all of the individual notes uh, without really messing up the other strings. Sometimes you are going to hit other strings. That's just, you know, it just is what it is it's called playing guitar, right? Nobody's perfect. A lot of people sound perfect, but that's because you're probably listening to a studio album and they had a zillion takes and there's a bunch of editing and polishing and real people don't sound like that. And guess what? We're all real people, right? So uh, even if you do, um, let's say, cause some other strings to vibrate or accidentally hit some other strings, there's some techniques we can talk about down the line where you can actually mute with your um, pigging hand so you, th the other strings don't actually sound. But that's not really important for right now. For right now, the tip is, pun intended, to use the tip of your fingers. And uh, that's what I would focus on for right now. I think we got you muted, Brock. Hey. There he is. There we go. All right. Uh, I play, this is this next question from Greg Lalande. Uh, I play the electric guitar, the steel string acoustic, and the classical nylon string all depending on the style of piece uh, to be played. Do you recommend to focus on only one type of guitar? Is there a danger to becoming a jack of all trade and a master of none? So that's a great question. Should you play only the electric guitar or is it dangerous to, to jump around from playing acoustic guitar or electric guitar or let's say classical guitar? I mean, honestly, it depends on what your goal is, right? So there's, what I always say is there's no, there's no such thing as good or bad. There's no best way to do X, Y, Z. There's no bad way to do something. The only thing that matters is what is your actual goal? And is are you using an effective way or a less effective way? That's all there is. There's a more effective way to reach whatever goal you're trying to reach or less effective way to do it. There's probably a lot more less effective ways to do it than there are more effective ways. But either way, that's beside the point. So you play different types of guitars. Well, it really doesn't matter if you should or not. What I would say first and foremost is what do you want to do? What makes your heart sing? Uh, for me personally, you know, let's say uh, I'm at home on a weekend by myself and maybe I might have a classical guitar, I might have my electric guitar plugged in, I might have an acoustic guitar all in the same room and you know, all of us, you know, we're all guitar nerds, right? So we have our guitars uh, laying out on the couch in the living room, you know, maybe in our favorite chair or just like sitting on a stand in the living room. Why? Just so we can go go to the kitchen and make some lunch and then come back out and pick up the acoustic and play for a while, look out the window or sit on the, the couch and just play the electric for a while and turn on the amp. It's all fun, right? Uh, so the first and foremost thing is do what you want to do. Uh, if you want to play the classical guitar because you're playing some song that sounds better with classical guitar, do it, enjoy it. 
don't be guilt don't feel guilty about that uh, if you want to play the electric guitar and you want to do some bend you play with some maybe some pedals or some effects or play just some electric guitar play really fast then do that um, when it comes to so first of all that's the first piece of advice is that the first thing you should do is what you want to do do you want to pick up the classical do it do you want to pick up the electric do it do you want to pick up the, up the acoustic do it now the second part of the question is is that dangerous and the assumption is is that dangerous in the sense of is it going to hurt my skills uh, is it is it bad to become a jack of all trades now again there's the same answer about your goals it depends on what your goals are do you want to be reasonably good at playing the acoustic guitar the electric guitar the uh, classical guitar um, then it really doesn't matter that much what is going to happen though is when you switch different guitars different guitars have different necks and we all know that acoustic guitars have thicker strings than electric guitars and nylon string guitars have even thicker strings and the actual shape of the neck is different as well so what's going to happen is your hand is going to have to adjust you're going to have to adjust a, a second when you start playing the new guitar to how the new guitar feels and that's naturally going to influence how you play as well um, the second part of that is if you really just if you just really want to be an amazing classical guitar player well look i mean we're all human and the reality of it is we only have so much time, right? Unfortunately, you know, as far as we know, we only get one life. Uh, there's only so many hours in a day and most of us are really busy. So if you really go far, one, uh, one instrument or one style, then I would definitely probably focus more on that one instrument. But, um, you know, if, if it's not really important to you, if you want to be pretty good at guitar, uh, maybe you don't want to be like Steve Vai or the greatest guitar shredder of all time. Or if, if that's not really your thing, you just play for your own enjoyment. Yeah, just pick up whatever guitar you want to pick up. Just enjoy it. There's an old African uh, proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Now, if you focus on one thing, I said go alone. Now, when I say alone or together, I'm referring to specific guitars. So if you want to go fast, meaning if you want to accelerate your skills with one, uh, one style or one, one guitar, go alone with that one guitar, right? But if you want to go far in terms of if you want to go, in this case, I'm thinking wide. Like if you want to go wide with your musical range or the, 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 your musical palette of different things that you can enjoy, then, then do it together. Together meaning have all your guitars together. Play the classical for a little while, play the electric for a little while, um, play the acoustic for a little while. All of those are going to give you different musical ranges that you can play with. They're going to give you different musical palettes that you can play with. And each one of those instruments is going to influence you as a musician to play in a slightly different way. So there you go. All right. All right. Just, I, 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 freak, I was freaking out. I thought I was muted again. All right. <laughs> All right, awesome. So, hey, if you guys are getting some value out of this so far, we still got a few more questions left, but definitely let us know in the chat box below or the comment section. Uh, give us a thumbs up if you're watching this on YouTube. Help us uh, optimize that YouTube algorithm. The next question is from Sean. Sean Payment, what's the best way to get away from playing sequential scale notes? Imitating others, is it worthwhile to let uh, to learn well-known licks and then uh, deconstruct them to see how they fit into the scale patterns. So what's the fastest way to get away from sounding like you're playing scales when you're playing scales? Well, the first the first part is already on point, meaning the first part is already right. We know that whenever we want to play lead guitar, uh, generally an easy way to get started playing the right notes is to learn some type of a pattern. And the pattern tells us where the right notes are. It allows our fingers to hit the right notes, right? Uh, without having to think about the names of the notes. But that's where most people get stuck because they continue to focus on the actual pattern itself and they play the pattern and they kind of expect some kind of magic to happen where maybe if I play the scale uh, of a million times, well, then some magical music is just going to happen. And that's just not true. That's only phase one or it's only first gear. There are a lot more gears in a car, right? But most people get stuck in first gear. Uh, they don't really realize that you can actually shift gears. So when you learn a pattern, like say a scale pattern, um, that's that's just gear number one. After you learn the pattern, you can play the right notes. Well, now you need to shift gears. So what does shifting gears look like? And how do you add those different, what I'll call musical layers? So the first thing is rhythm. 
if I'm just gonna play, let's say uh, three notes, if I'm just gonna play a scale pattern that looks like this, it just looks like that. And let's say those are the notes of the scale pattern. Well, no matter if I practice this 5,000 times, it's not gonna sound any different. Maybe the notes might sound more clear if I'm practicing more, uh, if I'm trying to sound more clear, but we need to add, we need to shift gears. We need to add some new layers to what we're playing in order to sound like music. The first thing that we need to do is listen. Okay, it sounds weird, but at first, when you're learning a scale pattern, your attention really isn't available to actually listen to the sound of what you're playing, at least not to a large extent. You're really focused, your brain, your mind is focused on, okay, am I hitting the right notes? Are my fingers going in the right place? Can I play the pattern? That's really what you're focused on, right? So the, the key is, after you've practiced that, and after it's not really that much of a challenge anymore, it doesn't matter if it's still a little bit of a challenge, that's a good thing. Uh, you don't want to stay, what I call staying on the vine too long, like a piece of fruit. You don't want to leave it on the vine too long until it rots. That's when stuff gets, that's when you play the same thing too much, that's when it gets old and boring and you just kind of start to feel disgusted with your progress because you you just play the same old stuff all the time and that stinks. So um, you want to first, like, like I said, learn where the notes are in the pattern, but that's just gear number one. After you feel reasonably comfortable, it doesn't have to be perfect. After you feel reasonably comfortable with where the notes are, then what you want to do is start shifting your attention to your ear. What is What am I hearing? I'm asking myself as I'm playing, what am I hearing when I play this? So if I practice these, this little scale pattern, that's the pattern, and I, I practice it so much to where I don't really have to think too much about what my fingers are doing, now I'm going to start to listen to what I'm playing. And here it is. Well, if I'm listening, it just kind of sounds like somebody playing a scale, right? So that's not what I want. So the next thing is, uh, again, you first want to start to listen to what you're doing. And as you become aware, you have the aural awareness of whatever it is that you're playing. Now you can start to focus on, it's, it's kind of like an artist who's going to paint a picture. But once you're aware of the different colors that you have on your palette, or meaning, let's say in this case, like the different scale notes that you have, well, now you can focus on, okay, how can I combine these colors on a canvas to actually create a landscape? And that's what we're talking about, uh, creating music. Like, how can I create a musical landscape? Okay, so after I start listening to the notes, I start listening to how these different notes make me feel. And in this case, without the, uh, you know, with absence of background music, I'm not going to get too much feeling out of this. I'm not sure if I can actually play, here we go, all these notes. There you go. You can kind of hear the feelings of those notes. So it gives me a feeling because there's some contrast or there's some juxtaposition between the notes, which actually produces an emotion or produces a feeling. Now, after I'm listening to the notes, the next thing I might want to consider adding is rhythm. And rhythm is essentially like the backbone of any music. It's what gets people bobbing their head. And what, it's what gets you tapping your foot if you go to a concert or a restaurant or you see people, you know, somebody just playing at your house at a party or whatever, right? It's, that's what we call it, getting into the music. So instead of just playing it straight ahead, what we call straight ahead, like this, just a boring scale, I'm first going to listen to it. And I'm going to recognize, hey, that just sounds like a boring scale. Okay, now let me add some rhythm to it. So what if I go... Well, now it's a little more interesting, even if it's not the most amazing thing in the world. What if I do? Now it starts to become a little bit musical. What if I do this? Now it's even more musical. What if I switch the order of the notes? So that's the second thing that I can do. Let's say we, we focus on the rhythm. Uh, let's say that's gear number three. And now we can start to play around with um, when do we play the notes? So, or or really slow, right? I can play along with the rhythm. I can play along with the timing of the notes. Next thing I can do is play along with the order of the notes. What if I did this? Now I'm adding rhythm with the order of the notes. Or now it's totally different, right? I'm only playing three notes. So I'm transforming what we previously had was a scale pattern. Now I'm starting to transform it into music layer by layer, okay? So first we had uh, gear number one is, or step number one is actually learn the pattern with your fingers. 
after you learn the pattern with your fingers, now you can shift your attention, shift gears, go to gear number two, shift your attention to listening to the notes. Now I'm listening to what sound sounds like. Okay. When you listen, when you really get good at listening, Eric Clapton said one time uh, in an interview that he went away for a year and he just practiced and practiced and practiced. And he got really, really good. And he started coming out with some great songs and the interviewer said, you know, what was it that made all the difference? And he said, I started listening to what I was playing. So gear number two, you start listening to the sound of what you're doing. When you do that, that's going to tell you what you need to change in your playing. Why? Because you know you already have some music that you want to express. You already, you already have something that you want to play. There's some way that you personally want to hear these specific notes that you're playing in the scale pattern. Again, everybody has music inside them. You have your own version, right? When you start listening, you're going to hear the difference between what you're playing and what you want to feel, what you're playing and what you want to be playing, right? So that's gear number two. So let's listen. Gear number three is add some different rhythm to it. So maybe it's uh, something like that. I change the notes around, but I, if I'm playing the notes in order, I'm just changing the rhythm. The fourth gear would be changing the, the, the order of the notes or something like that. And then finally, the fifth gear is what most people generally refer to as phrasing. Or in other words, how do you approach playing each one of these notes? So while I could just do this, I can also do this. I can slide or bend or whatever you want to do, hammer on, pull off, etc. Maybe I do this. Or now it sounds different. I'm just playing these same notes. Or I go, there you go. What if I do this? Now it's totally different. That even sounds kind of silly, right? So you start to play along, uh, play around with this phrasing techniques. And I explain all the techniques. I know we don't have time here, but I explain all the techniques in a course called Irresistible Phrasing 101, where you'll start to be able to use those phrasing techniques. Uh, in fact, there's a there we have a different course for each one of those gears uh, that I was just talking about. But I'll, I'll cover that in just a second. Um, the main point is when you add all of those five layers together, you start to get what we call music. You add together, you start listening to what you're playing. First of all, you learn the scale. You start listening to what you're playing, your ear, right? Then you add some rhythm to it. Then you change the order of the notes. And then you start adding some phrasing techniques on top of that. When you do all those things and you practice it, you're going to start playing music. So instead of playing, I might play something like this. Whoops. Something like that. Or who knows? It doesn't matter what it sounds like. My point is I'm just showing you how to add all of those together. And when you do that and you really listen to what you're playing, your hands are going to get used to doing all different, all five of those different gears or, you know, doing the phrasing, doing the rhythm, etc. But the whole point and the essence and the key to all of this is to listen to what you're doing and listen to or feel what it is that you want to be hearing. What is the music that you want to hear? Or what's the music that you already hear in your head? Try to match that on your guitar, and that's when you're really just letting the music flow. Awesome. Yeah, really good stuff. Uh, just a shout out, uh, Charlie C. put in the on YouTube, put this great thank you. And 30 days have come so far, and my love for the guitar has exploded. I spend 30 minutes on the ultimate dexterity, then just jam uh, out my feelings, exploring fretboard for hours. Isn't that awesome, awesome, Charlie? Thanks so much for sharing that, man. That is awesome. And again, that's what I referred to earlier as what I consider literally the best feeling on the planet. When you just pick up the guitar, you hear some music, and you just exactly what Charlie just said he's been doing. Even after 30 days, guys, he's just picking up the guitar and exploring the neck, exploring the fretboard for hours. It's so much fun. Like there's, It never stops being fun. It's so amazing. And that's why we do what we do, to help you have the same feeling. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing, sharing that, Charlie. Yeah, awesome. So, uh, yeah, let's let's roll on to the next one. Um, this next one is going to be a little longer, um, but uh, I'll read it once and then I'll paraphrase it to give you the, the clear uh, question. This one is from Sean again, Sean Payment. Um, I've gotten through a lot of the pentatonic patterns and major scales, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and and it is starting to gel. I'm beginning. I'm being able to see how all the various patterns are overlapped and fit together. For example, I might start at the fifth fret A on the low E 
<laughs> okay. For example, I might start at the fifth fret A on the low E, and I'll play the first pentatonic shape up and down, then adding the major notes, then the A major Ionian scale, then the diagonal pattern, then perhaps moving up and down a fret uh, to the Dorian, lo Locrian, and trying to understand how it all fits together. Will I eventually be able to stop thinking about the patterns or mode that I'm actually uh, actually playing it? So, so that's a great question. Yeah. I, I think I can go ahead and phrase that too. Yeah, awesome. So, essentially, when you're pr you're playing scales, you're practicing different scale patterns, right? You're practicing all these different patterns, and the question is, when you're learning these patterns, will is it ever going to all come together? Is it ever going? To, am I ever going to stop being able to think about it? And the answer is absolutely yes. We have a process for specifically guiding you to that moment to that point. And in fact, it turns out that there is actually just one pattern that covers, that repeats over the entire fretboard that you can literally play uh, in any major scale, any ma uh, minor scale, you know, any major key, any minor key, and all the modes with literally just one pattern. The reason why you may not have ever heard of it before, or the reason why most people have never seen it is because the pattern actually repeats across seven strings, not six. So if you had an you have an invisible string right here, I can we or we show you of course how the pattern works, how the pattern actually spans seven strings, and how that same pattern just repeats in different areas along the neck. It's just like if you've ever seen a piano. Uh, on a piano keyboard, there's one section of notes with twelve different keys, with two black keys and three black keys. Uh, you can look up a picture of a piano if you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, or you can go to a music store or something. But there's there's this one section. It's 12 notes. There's two black keys and three black keys. That same section repeats over and over and over and over and over again on the piano. That's all there is on the piano, right? There's only 12 notes in Western music. So there's the same 12 notes repeat over and over and over and over again. On the guitar, there's an invisible seventh string that there's this seven string pattern that contains the seven notes in whatever major or minor key that you're playing in. And that, just like a piano, that same pattern repeats over and over and over and over and over again. And it actually glues together all of the different scales that are out there, the major scales, the minor scales, the modes. It actually ties all those together into literally just one pattern. So you can play any of those modes with just one pattern. But that's just the first step. So as I've already talked about earlier, the mistake that most people make, um, and it's not their fault because they don't know it, right? You don't know what you don't know. But what most people do is they get stuck in first gear. First gear is learning the actual patterns themselves, right? And the only reason, by the way, the only reason we learn different patterns and connect them together, the only reason, listen closely, the only reason we learn those different patterns and connect them all together is so you can see how the entire fretboard connects. And then after you see that, you have that light bulb moment and you see the seven string pattern that I'm talking about. We call it the big repeating pattern or the freedom key system as part of that, right? then you no longer have to use those all those different patterns. You see how the entire fretboard connects. Now, is it useful to use the individual patterns? Of course it is, right? You can still think about those or use certain little finger patterns whenever you're playing. But the point is we wanna go to the next gear, right? We wanna go to the next level. And the next level is uh, once you actually learn the master roadmap, once you learn where all the right notes are by connecting these patterns, you discover that it's really only one centering pattern repeat over and over again. Now it's time to start listening, just like we talked about a little bit uh, a little bit ago. You need to shift your attention away from focusing on patterns. The patterns are not going to produce music for you. This is not a musical instrument. Most people say the guitar is a musical instrument. It's not. The guitar is just a machine. If I just put the guitar like this, and I just have my guitar right here, how long do I have to wait before it starts making music? I'm going to be waiting forever, right? It doesn't do anything. It just sits here. The music comes from you. Like any music that I'm playing comes from me. It's the emotions. It's the feelings that I'm trying to express. Now, those scale patterns that we're learning, number one, not only are they for getting you to be able to play the right notes in the key without having to think about the names of the notes, it gives you an easy way just to hit the right notes so that you can begin practicing and playing with, let's say, backing tracks and listening to the sounds that you're making so you can start to make music out of those sounds. That's the second gear. Most people get stuck in first gear of thinking that the patterns or they're focusing on the actual patterns themselves and wondering, okay, when are these patterns going to, you know, finally all come together and make music for me. And that's that's the thing. It, it, it never will. Gear number one is just for learning where the patterns are. 
when you like, let's say you're in first grade. Well, the purpose of first grade is to graduate and then go to second grade. Right. So after we're in first grade uh, and I'm not saying that learning all these patterns is first grade easy. It's really not. Um, but after we learn the patterns, after we learn how it connects together, then we need to graduate from doing that. You can still practice and keep your what some people call your technique up. Right. You can still practice the actual patterns just to make sure you have them down, just to keep your your wheels greased, so to speak, just to make sure you're in shape to play guitar. Your fingers are in shape. But you got to move on to the next gear. And the next gear is using the notes, using the right notes that you already know because of the patterns to start listening to the sounds that you're making and start to make music out of those sounds, start to be expressive uh, with those sounds. And how do you do that? Well, like I said before, we have uh, the courses on all the different types of um, ways that you can express notes on the guitar, specifically in Irresistible Phrasing 101, you're gonna know how to um, use things like what people call phrasing tools, which are you know hammer-ons, pull-offs, slides, bends, those kinds of things. But you're also gonna be able to add in other courses the other um, elements of music, which is what I call framework, knowing where all the right notes are. You know That's the first step. Uh, fitness, getting your fingers and your hands in shape to be able to do stretch like this. Look, my fingers could never, ever do this when I first started playing guitar. In fact, I couldn't do this until somebody showed me how to start doing this, right? And, and I, it wasn't just like, there's a trick and then all I, can, I can all of a sudden do it. No, your fingers are like athletes and the guitar neck is just like a playing field. You literally just like a basketball player has to go to the gym um, and, and work out and do drills on the court to be able to perform well in the game. Same thing with your fingers, right? There's no shortcuts. There's no magic pill as some people would have you believe, you know, learn this one little trick and you know, you'll magically be a guitar God in five days. Come on. Really? No, that's, that's not, that's not reality. Okay. There are specific drills that we can do. We have a course called unlimited dexterity, which will get your fingers to being able to look like this, to being able to move fluidly uh, across the neck. And if you actually do the exercise that I show you, it will happen because of the law of cause and effect. Just like if I throw this pick across the room, it's going to go across the room and hit on the floor, uh, hit the floor. And if I throw a ball up in the air, it's going to come back down to the ground. It's just how it works, right? If you just do the steps that we lay out for you, it just works. If it doesn't work, then that means you didn't work it. I promise you it works as long as you work it, okay? Now, the other elements of music, of course, that we train you on specifically um, to answer this question as well, that is uh, also harmony. So uh, harmony is any two or more notes played at the same time. What is the contrast of the notes? How does it make you feel? How do chords work? How do I know where the right uh, chords are? Uh, rhythm, which we've already talked about, which is pretty self-explanatory. Most people think of rhythm, uh, they think of rhythm playing rhythm guitar, meaning like playing chords, like I'm playing a song um, or I'm singing or I'm playing. But the reality is every single thing you play has rhythm. Even if you're playing just one note, that's a rhythm, right? There's different types of rhythms you can do. The better your rhythm skills are, the better you're going to sound as a musician. Okay. And the last one is phrasing. Phrasing is the first thing that we talked about a second ago, which is using things like phrasing tools such as bends and slides. And it's just changing the way that you approach playing each note to give it a little more flavor, to get a little, to give it a little more spice. But uh, yeah, so again, don't get stuck in first gear. Don't only focus on playing the patterns. Just do that as first gear, first grade. When it's time to graduate, you need to move on to second grade. Uh, and second grade is, you know, the classes get a little harder, right? In second grade, you have to stretch your skills just a little bit more. That's when you start incorporating the rhythm and the phrasing and the harmony with your playing. And you have to really listen to what you're doing and train your ear to hear what you want to hear in your head. You hear the sounds in your head and you work on playing those sounds on your guitar. That's the ultimate goal. Awesome. Awesome. So we have one question left, but I actually have a question um, for you. And that guitar that you are holding, can you tell us a little bit about it? I actually, Sam just, just Sam just commented on it. Um, but it looks cool. I love that finish. That color is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems rather unique. Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess it's unique. Uh, what's up, Sam? Thanks for tuning in. Appreciate you having me here, man. So this is obviously a little bit different guitar than most people are used to. Um, and I have to say that, you know, for years I built all my own guitars. So I taught myself woodworking. Uh, at some point I built a few guitars totally from scratch. But uh, over the last few years, I've built guitars from parts just because I wanted specific specs. I wanted specific fret sizes, 
specific uh, neck, you know, neck size, uh, just everything specific. I wanted specific pickups, how the knobs are laid out, etc. And I got really into ergonomic guitars. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not, you probably tell I'm not a flashy guy. I don't really care about anything about showing off. In fact, I'm the, I'm the opposite, right? I just want to stay in my bedroom and play guitar all day. Um, and then, of course, you know, answer questions like this and talk about guitar. That's always fun. But uh, I'm usually, I'm always in search of efficiency. And long story short, um, I haven't actually bought an off-the-shelf guitar in, in maybe 10 years, to be perfectly honest. But uh, there's a company called Strandberg, and I've been following them for, uh, for a few years uh, just because they make ergonomic guitars. And the way that they make the guitars is very, it, like I said, it's ergonomic. So everything is meant to be efficient. Everything is meant to make you or to help you play easier and help you play better. So I'll just point out a couple of different things and why this guitar looks funky. First of all, um, I'll just point this part out. This looks like maybe a shark took a bite out of my guitar. And that's literally just so I can rest it on my on my knee. So if my knee's right here, I can just rest it like that, right? And plus, it reduces a bunch of weight. There's no reason for a guitar to have wood right here. Same thing with this part right here. There's no reason for this wood to be here. It just exists and it's heavy. And personally, I've I've honestly had back problems since seventh grade. And um, let's say I go to a concert or something, I literally cannot stand up for five minutes. I have to squat down. Uh, I have to go sit in a chair or something. And it stinks, but it is what it is. So uh, part of it is wanting a light guitar. I, want, I really wanted a light guitar. And as you can see, there's no headstock here. Now, a lot of people hate the way this looks. Um, Again, I'm not so concerned about looks. Looks are important in terms of what inspires you. Like, does your guitar make you want to pick it up and play it? That's very important, in my opinion. But uh, I'm not so concerned about having a super nice guitar or anything like that. Uh, I just want something that feels good, that inspires me to play it. So headstock, I don't have tuners up here. There's a lot of weight that's not up here. It doesn't make my neck want to dip down whenever I put a strap on. So that's, um, that's another thing. And there's, there's something that's going to blow your mind in a second if you can see it in the light. But I just want to point out a couple of other things. So there's no tuners here. So where are the tuners? Well, the tuners are actually right here. So there, there, there are these little knobs, and uh, I can turn these knobs to tune the strings. So the ball end of the strings actually goes through this way. And the string uh, clamps in those little, I guess, I don't know what to call them, little clamps. Um, you can screw those little screws down and you just cut the strings off. It's really easy to change the strings. And a couple of other things. Uh, sounds like we've got some motorcycles outside. Sorry about that. There you go. It sounds like a pit bull or something. <laughs> yeah. So I want you to look at the frets. Can you notice anything about the frets? Anything interesting about the frets? Yeah, yeah. They're nice and uh, like angled. They're angled, yeah. So as you notice, as my hand goes this way, the frets start to angle a little bit. And that's what's called fanned frets. What happens is, here we go, I got the, the whole guitar there. If you notice the bridge is also at an angle, it's actually the, sorry, the screen is backwards, so it's hard to figure out how to, <laughs> this is a brain exercise, makes me a better guitar player, I guess. Um, man, this is tough. <laughs> <laughs> this, oh man, this is really tough. You guys should try this. Anyway, you can see how it's angled. Um, what happens is, there's two things. A byproduct is whenever I move my hand, I'm a human being, right? So whenever I move my hand and I leave my elbow in the same place, my hand naturally uh, changes angle, right? If I'm playing up and down the neck, my hand naturally changes angle. If all my frets are parallel, well, I have to do something weird like this, and it's hard to stretch, and it's hard to reach all the frets up here. But if I have these fanned frets while I'm playing, and then my hand naturally kind of goes along with the fan. See that? It's more ergonomic. That's actually just a byproduct, though. The most important part of this is that the strings, the bass strings, are longer uh, from here all the way to, man, this stuff, there. The bass strings are actually longer than the treble strings, which means the bass strings, since they're longer and they're still tuned to the standard tuning to the same pitch, they're actually tighter. So it means like the, the sound is snappier, uh, deeper, tighter, etc. And then going toward the treble strings, since they're shorter, they're actually not as harsh. They're sweeter. Um, there's the, the overall tone is a lot more balanced. And if you ever look at a grand piano, a grand piano has that weird shape on the back. The reason it has that shape is because the bass strings are longer than the treble strings. So that it has that weird shape back to extend the length of the bass strings. 
So this sounds a little bit more like a piano because it's a lot more balanced. Doesn't quite sound as out of tune like most guitars sound. The very little thing I'll point out is the actual back of the neck. And surprise, surprise, it's not round. It's a trapezoid. There you go. So if you notice that there's a one flat spot on the back of the neck, and uh, it's also the flat, well, sorry, there's three flat spots. In fact, every side is flat. So this side is flat, this side is flat, and this side is flat. So it's three flat sides. And on the very back of the neck, we have this, let's see, right there. We have this uh, perfectly flat spot. Now, any guitar that I've played over the past, let's say, 10 years, I've always sanded a, a flat spot on the back of the neck. Why? Just because when you, whenever you put your thumb on a flat spot, your fingers are much more relaxed. Your forearm is much more relaxed, so you can actually play faster. When you put your thumb, and you can try this if you're at home, if you're if you're near the edge of a table that's round, put your thumb on the edge of the table just like this, and try to wiggle your fingers. And what you're what you'll find is there's more tension in this part of your forearm, and that prevents your fingers from moving fast enough, and you're like you're really tense, right? A lot of a lot of guitar players grab the neck, and they really uh, uh, struggle with a lot of tension. I, I struggled with a lot of tension for a long time. So uh, if you're doing this little exercise on the edge of your table, like I said, find something that's round, put your thumb on it, on your fretting hand, wiggle your fingers. It's gonna be a little tough. And then go find the flat part of the table. Put your thumb on something that's totally flat and then wiggle your fingers. You're gonna find that it just feels more, it's, it's easier. It just feels easier, it feels more relaxed. So um, this, the last thing I'll say is this, the middle flat spot right here, if you notice how it angles up, as it goes down the neck. I don't know if you notice that. Can you see that? Yeah, 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 I see that. Okay, so the reason for that is that whenever you play the guitar, uh, normally when you're playing chords down here, look where my thumb is. As I shift my hand, my thumb naturally goes more toward the back. So that little flat spot that's on the back of my neck actually starts up here, and it goes down this way as I go up the neck. And all of those things together just make it a very, uh, you know, a lot more ergonomic guitar. It's a lot lighter because there's not more, um, there's not so much stuff on it, you know. And um, a lot of people hate it, and it is what it is. I don't, I don't like when people hate my guitar. I mean, who wants that? But uh, a lot of people hate headless guitars. Some people might remember Steinberger guitars from the '80s, or I think the '70s maybe. But um, yeah, it is what it is. Hey, you do you, right? Because this is this is what I like. So. I think it's a cool looking guitar. The back reminds me of like a like a Lamborghini or something. I don't know. It's just a, <laughs> a back. Yeah. Was, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the sharp edges and yeah, yeah. That's cool. Awesome. Nice, uh, nice guitar review there for you. All right. Awesome. Yeah, wasn't expecting that. All right. Last question. This one's from Dennis Wang, and I, I felt like this was a good last question. So, is there a pivotal point once you pass it? your body, mind, and guitar become one? Or is it something that you build up slowly? So how do you become one with your guitar? That is a fantastic question. I love this question. So we talked about this earlier, but I'll kind of recap. So the question is, is there a point where your body, mind, and your guitar, your instrument become one? Or is it something that you build up over time? Well, it's both, both and neither at the same time. So I'll leave it there, and then I'll come back to that in just a second. The first thing I want to recap that we talked about earlier is that the guitar is not a musical instrument. Okay, The guitar doesn't do anything. You do the things. You are the one moving your fingers around the strings. And the music, not just notes, not just sounds. The guitar, the guitar doesn't actually uh, make sounds. You, you initiate the sounds. The guitar resonates, and you hear the sounds but it doesn't make the sounds. The sounds, the music comes from you. Now you, you don't just want sounds, of course you want actual melody, you want music, right? And that's essentially you, that's the music inside of you literally, it's you singing, it's like your soul singing through the strings, through the notes. And does it take time to get to a point where you're completely fluid in that? Yes, because it's a language. Does it take time to get fluid in a language? Of course it does, but what what makes you? What makes it faster for you to be fluid in language? Speaking it more. What makes it faster um, for you to be more comfortable to where you don't really have to think about what you're saying? 
learn more words, speak to more people, have more conversations. Honestly, that's really what it boils down to. Now, when it comes to guitar, it's when I say it's both and neither, it's it's both. There's one moment where your body, mind, and guitar become one, and it also takes, uh, it's a progression, right? So along your progression, what you're going to notice is there are, just like when the clouds or when the sun is behind the clouds on a cloudy day, there are moments where the sun, where the clouds kind of part and the sun shines through, right? There's those moments. And then the clouds might cover up the sun again and then, then it's cloudy. As you play and as you get better, uh, of course, that's what our that's what breakthrough guitar is here for. By the way, is this sounds cheesy, but to allow your sun, your inner sun, to shine, and I'll explain how in a second. But uh, that's why we developed the guitar freedom formula, literally to give you that sense of freedom, to give you that uh, where you're to, to lead you to the point where your body, mind, and guitar do become one. So, what does the progression of that look like? Again, imagine a completely cloudy day, okay, and there you can't see the sun at all. There's, there's clouds everywhere, completely cover the sky. When you're just beginning on your guitar journey, it's always cloudy because you can play a few things, but it never really feels that great, never really sounds that great. You can't really put it all together. Um, over time, you learn more and more, and you get glimpses. You get those little tiny moments where, this, where the clouds part just a little bit. The sun kind, kind of shines through just a little bit, and you have those moments of kind of euphoria or that, that happy place where something just – works and whatever it is that you're playing in that one moment it might even be two notes or one note or four notes or two chords it doesn't matter you just have that one moment where the sun shines through and you're just you're just in the zone you're just there and you're, you're the body your body your mind your guitar is just it's all one thing it's one symphony happening at one time but more near the beginning of your guitar journey you just get a glimpse of that sun and then the cloud covers it back up again right so the better you get the better you get through what we teach in the Guitar Freedom Formula, which is, uh, you know, framework, uh, phrasing, fitness, harmony, and rhythm. Phrasing, knowing where all the right notes are and being able to hit them without thinking. Um, phrasing, knowing how to uh, basically, uh, whenever you play the notes, kind of manipulate the string a little bit to make it sound like music, to make it sound like you're singing. Fitness, how do I get my fingers in shape to be able to perform what it is that I want to play or the music that I want to hear on the field of the guitar fretboard, just like a football field, but it's a playing field for your fingers, right? Harmony, how do chords work? Where do I play them? Which chords sound good? What are the right chords and notes? And finally, rhythm. How do I make everything I play fit in with the music? And how do I connect with the song that I'm playing and make sure I never lose the groove, right? Those are the five elements of the guitar freedom formula. Add those five things together and you can literally play anything you set your mind to on the guitar. That's why we created it. That's what it's here for. And that's what we ultimately want for you is to have freedom on the guitar. Um, but going back to the example about the clouds. So in your guitar journey, everything's cloudy at first. The sun never really shines through. You can't really, it just doesn't feel great, right? And then as you play, you get a little better. You learn some skills, uh, the skills that we teach in the Guitar Freedom Formula, those specifically those five skills. Um, the sun, sh there's little pockets where the clouds are rolling through and then there's a little opening and then the clouds kind of cover up the sun again, right? But then as you play more and more, what's gonna happen is those clouds start to dis disappear, right? Those moments where the sun shines through last longer and longer and longer, and there's more of them. There's more, there's a higher frequency of those moments where the sun shines through. And then sometimes you might, um, as you pro keep progressing along your guitar journey, you keep getting better with those five skills we talk about, uh, phrasing, uh, fitness, phrasing, excuse me, framework, phrasing, fitness, harmony, and rhythm. As you get better at those five skills, the guitar freedom formula skills, what's going to happen is the clouds are going to start dissipating and there's fewer and fewer clouds. You have more moments and more time. You might even go a whole day or a whole week where the, the sun is just shining or maybe it's just an hour where you're just really in the zone. You're just really feeling it. it might be a couple hours. Um, or like Charlie said a minute ago, he's, he's you know just having fun exploring the fretboard for hours, right? So the sun was shining through. He's, he's loving it. And what happens is you get better and better and better and better. And eventually most of the clouds just disappear. And I say, I don't say all the clouds. There are moments where the sun just keeps shining and that music inside you just flows. It's, it's easy. It's effortless. You don't have to think about it. Your mind, your body, the guitar is all one thing. The music is just flowing. You're just like a radio 
where your brain is tuned in to the right station, to the right frequency, where the music comes through and it just keeps flowing through the guitar. And that's the best feeling on the planet. But I say most of the clouds and not all of the clouds because we're all human. We're, we're, none of us are perfect. Um, you can be really great at a few different musical styles or you know, a couple different musical styles, but nobody's great at everything, right? Everybody makes mistakes, right? The clouds will kind of cover up the sun sometimes. It's just gonna happen, we're all human. There's no such thing as perfection. And let's say for a good example of that is B.B. Uh, King. If you know who B.B. King was, uh, one of the greatest guitar players of all time, arguably um, one of the greatest blues guitar players of all time. He was one of a kind. He was B.B. King at what he played, right? But surprising to most people, if you go look up, there's a, there's a video with B.B. King and uh, Bono from U2. There's a video uh, of them trying to play together and B.B. King says, I don't do chords. B.B. King couldn't play a bar chord. Can you believe that? And he literally couldn't play chords. That's why he just played lead guitar all the time. And he was fantastic at what he did. But he still had some clouds in this guy, right? He just avoided the clouds. So anyway, there you go. That's how the guitar journey works. Um, that's how you eventually get to the point where your, your mind, your body, your guitar is all one. That's how the sun shines through where you can play your music, where you just, you're tuning, you're completely tuning in. The music is flowing through you and you have complete freedom on guitar. I think that's a great place to wrap it up for the last question. Wow. <laughs> great. <laughs> awesome. So this was a really great hour and a half that we spent here. Uh, thank you guys so much for getting on here at live with us. Uh, Craig says, um, uh, I've been a member for two months and the sun is shining more and more every day after 10 uh, wasted years. I never imagined I'd be here. Can't wait to see where I am two to four months from now. Wow. That's hey, a, Craig, that's a yeah. Craig, great having you on here, man. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that is so awesome to hear. And I encourage you to keep going because this, I promise you the sun will shine through more and more and more. You're going to enjoy your guitar playing so much more every single month. Just keep going, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, really good testimony just to, to end this off. So, guys, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Uh, definitely, if you guys missed part of it, go back and rewatch it from the beginning. There's a lot of really good stuff. Um, and if you are new to Breakthrough Guitar, there is a link in the description on YouTube where you can check out the ultimate uh, light bulb guitar moment where you can uh, just learn how to break through guitar, how to how to start on this journey that we've been talking about throughout this this whole call. Um, any final words, Jonathan? Yeah, so about the ultimate lead guitar light bulb moment. Look, if you're watching, if you got value out of this, uh, if you saw any of the sections with us here, we highly, highly encourage you to go ahead and dive into the ultimate lead guitar light bulb moment. We created it specifically for you to kind of introduce you to the method that we use uh, of playing guitar by feel, skipping all the boring and overwhelming theory, skipping all the information overload out there. Look, you don't need it, right? You don't, you don't need to waste your time doing all that. Uh, just like Craig said a second ago, He's been you know, playing for two months and he's having a blast and he wasted 10 years. Guys, you don't need to waste 10 years. Please don't do it. Please don't. Please pick up the Ultimate Lead Guitar Light Bulb moment if you haven't already. Um, and just to give you an idea of who that's for and what it will do for you, um, that's for more of the guitar player who's been playing for a little while. Maybe you picked it up six months ago or it could even be six decades, right? We've taught guitar players who have been playing uh, up to seven decades. That's 70 years, guys, and they still haven't been able to figure it out. So if you're anywhere in between, if you've been playing for a couple of months, or if you've been playing for 70 years, right? And there are a few things you can play, but maybe you kind of get frustrated. Maybe you play the same things over and over again sometimes. Uh, maybe you can't really, you don't really make that much progress. You kind of spin your wheels when you practice sometimes. Maybe you go on YouTube and you get frustrated. You can't really uh, find who, who should you pay attention to? What should you actually be learning? Should I learn the circle of fists or the cage system or the theory or should I read music or should I do this? Uh, it's, it's overwhelming, guys. Um, and that's why we created the ultimate lead guitar light bulb moment for, for the guys who want to progress, want to be able to understand the why behind what they're doing on the guitar neck, want to be able to start playing lead guitar. And the reason why we say lead guitar is not only because it's amazing, but because it gives you the foundation of everything in music through what we teach. So no matter if you want to play chords, if you want to write your own songs, if you want to write your own solos, if you want to just play with your kids or your grandkids or your father or your, or your mother or your family or whoever, um, 
definitely get into the ultimate lead guitar light bulb moment because we show you the one thing uh, that you need to start, or not that you need to, but that will that you can start using to literally open up a whole new world in the fretboard, yeah. and you'll see how it all works. Okay, and then from there we can take the next steps. But guys, if you haven't already, dive into the ultimate lead guitar light bulb moment, and uh, that's all I got. So thanks guys so much for being on here. We we so much appreciate you. It's honestly a privilege uh, for Brock and I to get on here yeah. to you know to take our time. Like we we don't want to be eating dinner right now. We could be going to eat <laughs> eat dinner and making hot pockets in the microwave, but we would so much rather you know, hop on with you guys and spend time with you guys and enjoy the journey, talk guitar with you, help you guys on your journey. Uh, Cause it's, it's a blessing. It's, it's fulfilling and yeah. it's, it's, it's great. So we're very privileged. Thank you guys for being on. Awesome. So thank you. If you guys are on YouTube, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, hit the bell notifications. We're uploading backing tracks every week. We're uploading videos like this and, and trainings every week. So thank you so much guys.